Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Today's Gospel reading is a rather short account of Jesus interacting with the man on the street. It's actually quite an enjoyable text to work through. As we see the story develop line by line, we also get to see our Lord's heart and also the heart of his message both to the man on the street and to all of us today. We Christians also have the added benefit of being able to read between the lines a little bit and get more out of this story than maybe what it seems at first value. At the beginning of this account, Jesus sets out for a journey. And as he walks down that dusty road, a man runs up to him and kneels down before him. The man then asks Jesus a very pointed question, saying to him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? With this very first sentence out of the man's mouth, Jesus can already tell that this stranger is trying to butter him up a bit. And so Jesus responds to his question very directly, saying, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You see, Jesus catches that this man only calls him a good teacher. He does not call him the Son of Man, Son of God, Son of David, Emmanuel, Messiah, any of our Lord's divine names. This gives us a hint that this man views Jesus only as a teacher of wisdom, perhaps the newest one on the scene, that this man wants to seek his approval in front of the crowds. And that's probably why the man waited to go to Jesus until he was on the road. He certainly could have gone to Jesus privately in the house that he had been staying at to ask him his question, but instead this man waits until Jesus is leaving town, probably surrounded by all the people that he had preached to and ministered to during his stay there. It is only in front of this crowd that the man then comes and makes a big show of kneeling down in front of him. Don't we often act the same way? Don't we like to be seen when we're doing something good and pious? Don't we like people to know that we volunteer our time, or that we go to church, or that we give to charity? We like to have people comment on our big house, or nice car, or perfect family, or the accomplishments of our children or grandchildren, or what we've accomplished at work. We like to have our name printed on stuff or see it up there on the scoreboard. We like to be seen, even when the scriptures are the ones that tell us that we should pray in private, give in secret, and always take the lowest place. But we, like the man in our story, often like to trumpet our good works for all to see. So Jesus tests this man. The Lord of all plays dumb, pretending as if he were not God himself in the flesh. If this man responded to Jesus' words, saying, Oh, certainly you're right, Lord. Only God is good, but you are the very Son of God, the very Messiah come to save us, then we might know that this man had faith in his heart. But he doesn't respond that way. And so now we see what our Lord Jesus already knew, that this man didn't really believe in Jesus as the Christ. And even we good, faithful Christians can fall into a similar trap. Rather than see our Lord as the rightful owner of all of our heart, body, mind, time, talent, and treasures, we sometimes see him only as a good teacher, sent us to give us tips on how to live a better life, how to be nice to people, how to love and cherish and accept others in order to make them feel good about themselves at all costs, how to make ourselves feel good about ourselves at all costs. But that's not really who Jesus is. That's not really why Jesus came. And we'll see that Jesus has a very different definition of what it means to truly love someone than what we might expect. We'll get to that in just a few verses. But before we get there, we see in our story that the Lord Jesus needs to preach a little bit of law. To this man on the street, Jesus rattles off the commandments to him, telling him that he already knows what he must do to inherit eternal life. And here we can see that the Lord paid close attention to the man's question at the very beginning. For the man did not ask Jesus, Lord, what must I believe in order to be saved? Or even, what must I have to be saved? Or who am I to follow to be saved? No, the man asked Jesus, what he must do. 
So Jesus tells him what he must do. He gives him the straight answer by listing off God's commandments, virtually quoting his heavenly father from the Old Testament, saying to the man, do all of this and you shall live. Do not do and you shall surely die. We good Lutherans know that keeping the commandments perfectly is impossible. Any student of the Bible can see how impossible it was for the people of Israel to do that very thing in the Old Testament. And yet they, and also you and I, often do it anyway. We think that a better-than-my-neighbor score is good enough in the Lord's book, or that the good deeds that we're so proud of should somehow outweigh the sins that we sweep under the rug. Perhaps we justify and explain away our actions, blaming the situation, blaming other people, maybe even blaming God for putting us into that situation in the first place. But if we were prudent, if we were smart and faithful, we wouldn't do any of that. We would simply fall down to our knees in confession to our God, seeking the Lord's mercy without any pretense of merit or worthiness on our part. So likewise, if the man in our story were prudent and smart, he would have said to Jesus, Ah, oh, shucks, Lord, I know I haven't done all that. I guess I need help. Oh, Lord, to whom shall I go? But the man doesn't respond that way, does he? Instead, the man puffs up his chest and says to the Lord, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. By this simple statement, the man reveals himself to be nothing but a liar. He's kept all of the commandments from his youth? Hogwash. Even if we could believe that a man could be so faithful and devout that he could stop sinning completely in his adult years, I don't think there's a person among us who's ever spent any amount of time at all with a child who truly believes that they are capable of keeping all of God's commandments all of the time. Even in adulthood, you know, I've met some pretty good, faithful, and humble people who have certainly impressed me with their ability to fight off the devil's temptations and to seek first the kingdom of God above all else. But you know what? Those are the very same people who will also be the first to tell you that they sin each and every day despite all of their best efforts. This man in our story is doing nothing but living in denial. So we too, when we hear God's word about how our sins should bring death upon us, of how even one transgression destines us for hell and damnation, how breaking God's law on even one commandment makes us guilty of breaking the whole thing, how can we describe any of our attempts to present ourselves as good and humble folk as anything but lies to our God? How can we claim that we deserve God's blessings? How can we, like the man in the story, pretend that we've somehow already done all that God commands of us? And now that we'd like his stamp of approval and his, even his accolades to us for living such a holy and righteous life. We can't do any of those things. That's as clear as day. So in response to such a statement from the man, we might expect Jesus to condemn this man on the road, to set him straight about his sins. But instead we read in Mark that Christ loved the man. Upon seeing those words in our text, we might expect our Lord's next words to be ones of comfort and acceptance, saying, oh, that's okay, well, don't worry about it. <clears throat> but that's not what we find here. Jesus has a very different way to express his great love for this man than what we might expect. Knowing that the man loves his great wealth above all else and is living a deluded lie that how he's living his life is somehow pleasing to God and worthy of earning eternal life, our Lord, out of that great love for this man, tells the man to go and sell everything that is dear to him, to give the money to the poor, and then the most important part, to follow Jesus, just like one of those poor fishermen disciples that were probably following Jesus on the road that day. We might think, what kind of love is this? Why doesn't Jesus accept us for who we are and what we do? Why doesn't God 
ignore or condone the sins that we commit, especially since he knows how incapable we are of resisting temptation all the time. Why doesn't our God get with the times and change his thinking on issues that our modern society has evolved past? Why does Jesus himself hold up this impossible task, this impossible law for us to keep, for us to mirror and guide our lives against? Why does God do this? Because he loves us. That's why. You see, God loves us enough to tell us the truth even when it's difficult to hear. God loves us enough to call us to be different than what we are and what we really want to be. God loves us enough to point out that the way that we're often thinking or feeling about something may not be godly and instead may actually spring from an evil heart that is against his will. God loves us enough to command, invite, and yes, even discipline us back onto that narrow path of his word, his truth, and his righteousness. He does that because he knows that that is the only way to eternal salvation. That is the only way to the eternal life that that man on the road and all us men and women in here are seeking. And that is how Jesus loves, even if we don't see it that way. The man in the story didn't see it that way either. He went away sorrowful and disheartened, Mark tells us. And who can blame him? His world was turned upside down. All the good things that he thought he was doing in order to follow God and be right with God turned out to be nothing but serving himself, his own pride, his own accomplishments. In the end, the man discovered that he couldn't give up his idols of wealth and accomplishments in order to make room for the true Lord of heaven and earth in his heart. And that's a rather sad ending. But you and I have a benefit over this rich young man in Mark's gospel. For we know that this isn't the whole of the story. For we know how else Jesus loves us. We know that Jesus loves from the cross. Jesus loves from the tomb. Jesus loves from the empty garden on that Easter Sunday. The man in the story missed the the words of our Lord, the ones that said, follow me, the ones that say, believe in me, cling to me. Those words resound throughout our Lord's entire interaction with this man. And yet he did not see and he did not know what you and I know, that Jesus covers over our transgressions, that Jesus calls broken people to be his disciples. That Jesus tolerates and, yes, even loves those of us who are at war within themselves. Those of us who do not do the good that we want to do, but instead keep on doing the evil that we don't want to do. Those are who Jesus calls to be the disciples. The man missed that this Jesus standing in front of him was indeed there for him. That he lived for him, that he would die for him, not to teach him how to live a better life, not to teach him how to earn his way into heaven, but rather to give those great treasures to him as an undeserved gift. And you and I have those treasures. You and I have that benefit. And yet, the Lord's message to us is the same that it is to that man. So dear friends, sell all your self-righteous possessions. Give away all that you trust in that is not Christ Jesus alone. Clearance rack all of your sins, doubts, and attempts to get right with God. And Jesus Christ will buy them all. Not with gold, not with silver, but with his holy and precious blood, his innocent suffering and death. Our Lord has done it all for you. There is nothing left for you to do. We simply receive. Our Lord Jesus has already given you his greatest possessions stored up in heaven for you, even when you had absolutely nothing to offer him in return. And that is why all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise shall forever be his alone. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ, our only hope in this life and the next. Amen.